credentials, and now the malware has the admin's, the parent's credentials, and can infect the parent's account. Now, but, but you, you said something, I mean, you kind of drifted by it quickly. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by, because uh, malware can intercept uh, process elevation requests? Yeah, so. Why? How? Well, it, well, if we're making the assumption that the child's account is infected, and okay. I'll come back to that okay. in a minute. So let's just say the child has malware running in the account. Now, the malware running in that child's account can see everything the child does. It can see their keystrokes. It can watch what programs they launch. Got it. And so when they go launch this game, it can look at the game and go, oh, this looks like an installer. I know there's going to be a UAC pop, uh, prompt here. Mm -hmm. I know the child's going to expect to see one, and the parent's going to expect to see one, too. So what I'm going to do is put up a fake one. Okay and capture the parent's credentials. And now with the parent's credentials, I gain access to the admin account. But now the thing that I'm confused with is that if the malware is running, because let's be honest, if, if the child puts 64 is a very, I mean, that's the future. 32-bit yep. is great, it's still around for compatibility reasons. 64-bit yep. is the future, then we moved to 128-bit. And we chose an X64 for Vista to be very strict. Everything has to be signed on the machine. Yeah. You can't have a driver on there that's not signed. All executables need to be signed that ship in the box. Yeah. And that would hurt 32-bit compatibility world. So let's talk about how does one go about preventing a rootkit? How does one go about preventing a rootkit? Don't run Automatic anything. <laughs> <laughs> Disconnect from the network and don't run anything. Okay. So let's talk about patch guard then, yeah. briefly. I mean. So uh, patch guard is not so much a rootkit detection mechanism. It's a best practices in kernel mode okay. enforcement mechanism. Sure. So uh, it basically sits in the background and looks at kernel data structures and code, mm -hmm. just a small set of what's in the kernel, mm -hmm. the very core. And if it detects that somebody's messing with that stuff, we'll crash the machine. Mm -hmm. Now, it's considered a rootkit detection mechanism because rootkits commonly go and on 32-bit systems go mess with those core data structures in order to hook into the system at a deep level and mm -hmm. manipulate what the systems what other stuff sees about what's going on sure but when I say best practices uh, there's lots of software out there that's legitimate software that does these things on 32-bit windows mm -hmm. that are not rootkits I mentioned red uh, did I mention Regmon earlier I no, talked about FileMon. Yeah, but Regmon. Yeah. Regmon cool. came out. That was the third tool that we wrote for Windows XP Regmon to monitor registry activity. And the, when I looked at at registry, I, I realized that file system was really important to the operation of Windows. And then I immediately realized the registry is also really important. Mm -hmm. And how can I see what's going on in the registry? There's no filtering model like there is for file system filters, like mm -hmm. FileMon could take advantage of for the registry on Windows NT, those earlier versions. So. I went back to the way that I'd done things on Unix, which is by hooking the system call table, uh, the way that I'd done it with Unix source code when I was working on my PhD. But now I was doing it from outside without, without the source, but I was just patching that data structure directly. So when somebody calls a system call, that goes through a table, an index table. So you call a system call and it's identified to you as a name, but internally it's a number. Mm -hmm. And the number is just an index into this table and the kernel calls the function that's at that index in the table. Mm. If I replace the function in that index, then to, with the pointer to my own code, then the kernel, when it call, somebody calls that system call, actually calls me, not the kernel's function. Mm. And so now I get invoked, I can look at the parameters going in, then I call the original function, the kernel's original function, and I get control back after it's finished, I look at the results, and then I can return back to the caller. And Regmon did that to watch stuff going into the registry APIs and coming back, and the statuses coming back out, and data coming back out. Okay. That patching of the system call table is not supported, and there's race conditions that are associated with it, and so it's it's not a best practice from kernel mode programming point of view. And sure, uh, with Windows Server 2003, actually the the work started in XP, but really was kind of fleshed out in Server 2003 there's a filtering model that was developed for the registry. So you don't have to hook anymore. You can just call the registry and say, I'd like to see registry calls. And then you get called in a, in a supported way by the OS. And it makes sure that you're called in line safely with other th guys that want to see what's going on with the registry. Excellent. So that's the best practice there, not hooking the, the system call table. 
Sure. So Pat, one of Pat's guards. So there's legitimate. Regmon was legitimate software. It wasn't Absolutely. written, but it was doing something that wasn't best practice because I was basically forced to. True. At the time, but understood. I mean, that's that's a good point. I mean, there's other companies that have written rootkits. Uh, yeah. You know, for but they weren't really trying. <laughs> yeah. But boy, they got hammered. Yeah. Uh, and deser deservedly so, in my opinion. But let me ask you this. I mean, FileMon certainly, you know, RegMon certainly not in that. That's a, that's a tool for persistent mins and developers to use to help them do their job on mm -hmm. this. Um, so the core problem here, of course, is allowing people to run random code in the kernel, which unfortunately you need to do if you want to have things like drivers yeah. that, that you know, give you your screen and whatever else. But in Vista, we've done a great job of moving some of that stuff up into user mode. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, that stuff, that supports an XP, too. Does it? Yeah. So back backwards, yep. like how's that? So Explain. there's well, there's a something called the user mode driver framework. Absolutely. Which, yeah, you've probably done it. I We've think you've done, done it. Channel nine. Yeah, we had yeah, Dorn Hall on. Yeah, Dorn. Yeah. Was, was he kernel mode? One yeah, of them. He did user mode too. Okay, cool. Yeah. So user mode driver framework is basically support in the OS through a service, the user mode driver framework service that hosts. Uh, so people program to this new model. Mm -hmm. They want their driver to run in user mode, and this is a model that people that write drivers for a whole bunch of classes of devices, like USB devices, the big one. Yeah. So if you got something that talks to USB, you can write it as a user mode driver, and then it runs inside of a host process up in user mode. Good. And it talks to the device through, it proxy calls into the user mode driver framework, which consists of user mode code and a kernel mode driver. Cool. Yeah. So the benefit you get out of that is not security so much, but reliability. Because yeah. now your driver crashes, the user mode driver framework starts it up again, mm -hmm. and from the user's point of view, nothing happened. They might get a balloon that says, you know, this the device experienced a problem, but it's recovered or whatever. Yeah, but, totally. But we they don't get a blue started. screen. You got yeah. it. So, uh, so that's the big benefit of user mode drivers. Mm -hmm. And I forgot where where. Well, I where I was going was, I mean, uh, and that's typically in my yeah. interviews because I mean we take them all over the place. But I mean, where I was going with that is is the real problem, the root of the rootkit problem. And it's not like it's a vast, terrible problem. I mean, I'm yeah. not trying to paint that picture. Is the fact that we allow people to write code in the kernel, and we have for a very, very long time. Um, and we can't talk about the future of Windows, but we can talk about like X64. Yeah. Where if you're going to write code in the kernel, it has to be signed. Yep. Okay. Right? Well, let me talk about that sure, for a second. Sure. Please. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned driver signing on 64-bit, uh, which is the new policy in Windows Vista. Uh -huh. On 32-bit Vista, by the way, you can flip a switch and say that that's the policy for 32-bit as well, but by, off by default because of all the legacy stuff out there that's not signed. Sure. Is that a security boundary? We talk, You talked yeah, about it? security boundaries. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so so right. that is, um, that is uh, uh, kind of a better world where the, that's the policy uh, that the system will enforce by default. If you get arbitrary code running on this machine, it can mess with that policy. Okay. And without, if it gets admin rights on the machine, it can mess with that policy. So, is it a security boundary from the point of, from uh, perspective of a standard user? Yeah, standard user, but standard user can't install drivers anyway. But is it a security boundary from the point of view of an admin user? No. There's if you're an admin on the box today, you've got your you own the box. Mm -hmm. uh, even patch patch guard is not a security boundary either. It's because somebody could figure out a way to hey patch guard's looking here or patch guard's doing this kind of detection and I can sure. foil it this particular way. Now let me ask you this question real quickly because you come from the Unix background. Yeah. Let's make no mistake. That's a that's a Unix legacy of having user of having uh, various modes of security context, if you will, root and whatever, user. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I guess one, you know, kind of begs the question, how long do we keep, have to keep having this 20, 20 year model, right? I mean, maybe it wasn't the case in Windows 95 where you just, God knows what you ran as, I don't even remember. Yeah. Um, but is it, wouldn't that make sense to have, like, where you, you don't have to think about, that's an administrative task, that's a, I'm a user, right? Yeah. I'm sitting at home, like, like my dad. I don't want my dad thinking about security boundaries. Yeah. I want him to check his email. I want him to, to play his games, do what he does on his computer, right? Yep. That's the goal for the consumer. So, 
it just seems to me like it's a really hard problem that you guys are working on. And yeah, it, and maybe you can help educate me a little more and everybody watching. Let's 